Today we're starting a new series called Exodus Stories, The God Who Saves. Over the next eight weeks, we're going to walk through some of the, the big moments in the book of Exodus. If you're, if you're concerned that it took us 14 weeks to preach through five chapters of 1 Peter, uh, you know, if we were taking that same approach with Exodus, we would finish in about 2030. So uh, we're not. We're going to kind of hit some of the highlight moments of Exodus and see how those apply to our lives as well. So if you're unfamiliar, Exodus is the second book in your Bible. So there's Genesis and then Exodus. Exodus is the story of God leading the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, through the desert, and ultimately into the promised land. And so Exodus is one of these stories that that you really see kind of foreshadows a lot of the other stories that we find in the scriptures. It's a prequel, if you will, to the gospel story, to God hearing his people crying out, sending a savior to them, and leading them out from where they are into where he wants them to be. And so over the next couple weeks, we're going to just slowly walk through some of those big moments and see what they teach us about God's interaction, his involvement in our lives today. There's a, a wonderful little book called Echoes in Exodus. It's kind of a, a short devotional written by a guy named Alistair Roberts and Andrew Wilson. And they kind of show how many of the themes of Exodus are played out in other places throughout the Old Testament prophets, in the Gospels, in the Epistles even. And there's, they have this, this little quote at the beginning of their book. They say that Exodus is central to the Scriptures, central to the Gospel, and central to Christian life. Whatever, the book, whatever book of the Bible you are reading, and whichever Christian practices you are involved in, echoes of Exodus are in there somewhere. Exodus is a story of faith. It's a story of God's people being in trouble and crying out, and God seeing them, hearing them, and intervening on their behalf. Exodus reminds us that God always has a plan, always has a destination, and is always with us every step of the journey. This morning, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 1 and Exodus chapter 3 and see how God intervenes when bad things happen and how he intervenes when we cry out. Next Sunday, I hope you'll make a a point to be here. Next Sunday, we have a guest speaker. Stephen Kurt is a missionary to Burundi, and Stephen's going to continue our Exodus story by looking at the story of Moses and how God calls unlikely people from unlikely places to be unlikely heroes in his salvation story. Stephen is working with a group of church planters in Burundi, and they are are seeing God move in incredible ways in this small nation in the center of Africa. If you were with us last November, you had an opportunity to join with us to plant churches in Burundi. Uh, They have since trained another group of about 20 church planters who are out and active in cities and small towns and villages all around that nation. With each one of those churches, because of the economy of Burundi and and some special connections that Stephen and the Burundi Assemblies of God have developed, they're able to build church buildings for $5,000. So last year, Stephen came and presented us with that opportunity. We were able to build 14 buildings, uh, church buildings in Burundi. Uh, Number 12 and 13 are almost completely done. 14 should be getting started here anytime soon. So Stephen's going to be back next week, and we're going to have an opportunity to do that again. Uh, As a church, we've already committed, we're going to build one of those no matter what, and then we're going to just trust God to speak to us individually. Um, Some of us might feel like God puts it on our heart of, hey, we're going to cover one entire church or two or three or basically however many you've got, they have pastors waiting. The, The biggest benefit of that is that what they have found in Burundi when they plant churches is every time the building goes up, it adds a sense of permanence and significance to that local church in that community. And with that sense of permanence and significance, those local church pastors have been able to further share the gospel in their cities, their villages, their towns. And on average, they see 100 new people become followers of Christ every time that church building goes up. So for $5,000, that's what we're investing in. That's the opportunity we're going to have. And next week, Stephen's going to share from that story of Moses, and we're going to see that God still calls people to do things that are beyond their wildest dreams or imaginations. But when you take that step of faith and follow him, he's going to lead you through it. Uh, But Stephen's going to get to preach that, so I will not preach it today, uh, even though it was a hard one to give up because it's a really 
great passage to preach, right? I don't know if you know this. As a pastor, you always want to give the hard passages to someone else and uh, save the easy ones for yourself. But Stephen's going to get that next week. It's going to be great. So please, please, please be sure to be here. Today, though, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 1 and talk about what happens when bad things happen and how does God intervene when we cry out. So Exodus chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 6 if you have your Bible. If not, it'll be here on the screens for you. It says, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So Exodus is a continuation of the story that occurs at the end of Genesis with Joseph and his family settling in Egypt, being saved from a famine. God leads them there miraculously. And once they're there, they move from a large family and become a small nation over the course of many generations. In verse 8, it says, Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on on the delivery stool, If you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Now, the Exodus story reminds us that bad things happen even to God's chosen people. And as we read through their story, we see them moving from a space where they were really experiencing the blessing and seeing the tangible benefits of following God with Joseph and his family. God saved, he delivered, he provided, he elevated Joseph and his family to a position of privilege. And then within a few generations, all of that is gone and God's people find themselves on a path that seems to be getting progressively worse. Listen to the words that describe it. They were slaves, they were oppressed. They were forced labor. Their masters worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor. They killed their baby boys. Life was hard for the Israelites. It didn't make any sense at all. And you have to think at some point along the way, they started to have those questions of why is this happening to us? What did we do to deserve this? How have we missed God's will? How has God grown silent and is not hearing our cries anymore? You and I know what that's like if you've ever been in a season where it just seems like, hey, everything was good, and then it got a little worse, and then it got a little worse, and then it got a lot worse. You've had the moments of there was a family loss, and then there was a physical sickness, and then there was a financial problem, and then there was, I mean, this is the story of 2020. When we don't think it can get worse, it does, and we don't know when it's going to end. We don't know where it's going to get better. And so when we consider the Israelites' story, and if we believe that the Exodus story is ultimately a gospel story and is ultimately our story, then that means God does have a plan when bad things happen. The first thing you see as you read through Exodus 1 is that when bad things happen, it's because the enemy is scared. The growth of the Israelites in Egypt was the direct fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. He came and he spoke to Abraham and he told you, I'm going to make you into a great nation, too numerous to count. And then with Joseph, this small nation is still basically a family unit. And they're on the verge of dying out due to a famine. And so God takes them into Egypt in this kind of famine-proof land. And there they live, and there they thrive, and there they grow. And they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they multiply, and they spread. Right? And, and so God is blessing the nation of Israel even while they're in Egypt. And what we see in Exodus chapter 1 is God's blessing causes Pharaoh to act in an antagonistic way towards the Israelites. Reminding us of not every good thing God does for you will be celebrated by everyone else. 
In fact, sometimes the more God pours his blessing out on you, the more opposition may rise up against you. Now, again, I told you there are echoes of Exodus all through the scriptures. This immediately takes us back to what we just looked at last week in 1 Peter chapter 5, that you have a real enemy who's prowling around seeking whom he may devour. This is Pharaoh's response to the blessing of the Israelites. In verse uh, 9, he says, look, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Now, the, the typical way that I have read and understood that passage is there's just too many Israelites and Pharaoh's scared that they might rise up with his enemies. He later says as much. If somebody attacks, they might join our enemies and fight against us and then leave our land. But a, a more literal translation of, of that verse, Exodus 1, 9, says the nation of the Israelites had become so numerous as to be stronger than we are. In Pharaoh's phrasing, he's not even saying, hey, someday they might. He's saying right now they are. They are bigger, they are stronger. They're a threat to our way of life. They're a threat to our security. So we must deal with them severely. The same way in your life, when bad things happen, yes, God can use it. Yes, he can refine you through it. But never forget the enemy has a plan to destroy you in it. And his plan to destroy you is motivated by his own destruction. In the same way Pharaoh knew, they are already stronger than us. So the enemy of our souls knows he has already been defeated in Christ. Our end has already been promised in him. Our identity is secure. And so his only hope is to use temporary circumstances to separate us from our eternal Savior. So when bad things happen, we don't want to get so stuck in the circumstances that we forget the big picture. And the big picture is that our life is never just about us, but it's this eternal struggle between God and his righteous plan and the enemy and his plans for destruction. But it's not an even match. See, Exodus is a story of the battle of the gods. And any time you battle God, you lose. Pharaoh has a plan. He works his plan to absolute perfection from his perspective. And he fails miserably. Because when the enemy attacks, God has already won. And so we want to remember this in our own lives as well. Yes, it may be hard. Yes, it may be difficult. But we believe the Exodus story is our story. And the Exodus story is a story of a God who saves, a God who leads out, and a God who already knows where the promised land and the final victory lies. So he's going to do whatever it takes to get us there. As you keep reading, we see that when bad things happen, God works. In verse 12, it says, The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. You see, God's blessing was not stopped by Pharaoh's intervention. No matter how many times, I mean, the the picture is, no matter how hard Pharaoh pressed down, it just caused the Israelites to multiply and spread even more. Bad things happening to you cannot stop the work of God in you. When Jesus comes and saves and delivers and heals, it means as followers of him, we now believe there are no wasted moments with God. And that what the enemy intends to crush and wipe out, God will instead use to refine and multiply. Anything that enables us to depend more on God, to grow in his grace, to walk in his love, is ultimately a good thing. And so we want to remember, no matter what season of life we're in right now, no matter how bad it may seem, God is at work. And we're going to see it again and again and again. The Exodus story reminds us God works in every circumstance. When we're enslaved, he delivers. When we're stuck between an army and a sea, he parts the waters. When we're hungry and thirsty, he provides for us. When we are faithless and sinful, he forgives and remains faithful. We don't know exactly why God allows the nation of Israel to be enslaved in Egypt. And now, now you can do some reading and there's different theories of perhaps God allows them to be in Egypt so that they grow from a large family into a small nation that can one day conquer and occupy the promised land. Or perhaps God allows them to be enslaved in Egypt so that the day will come when the Egyptians and all the surrounding nations will know that there is one Lord and he is God. We don't know exactly why God allows them. We just know that he works through it. 
It's the same way in our seasons of suffering, our seasons of difficulty. When I look back at some of the lowest, darkest, hardest moments of my life, I rarely knew in the middle of it what God was doing. It was only now with the benefit of hindsight that I can look back and say, this is what God was teaching me there. This was how he used that to refine me. This was how he saved. This was how he delivered. This was how he healed. This was how he led, led me out of that. But in the middle of it, we don't always have those answers. And so all we can really trust is that when bad things happen, God works. And so I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know if it's physical, if it's emotional, if it's mental, if it's financial, if it's relational. I don't know your problems. I don't know what caused them. I don't know how you're going to get out of them. But I know God is at work in them. This is what Exodus will remind us of over and over and over again. God's action is not based off of what you do or might do, but it's based off of who he is. And he is always a God who moves towards and moves in the hard, tough seasons of life. We also see that when bad things happen, we don't have to become bad people. The Israelites were treated ruthlessly, but they did not become ruthless. The midwives were ordered to kill every baby boy, but it says they, however, disobeyed. Because they feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do, they let the little boys live. There's always a temptation when life is hard to use our circumstances to excuse our sin. To just think, well, hey, you know, I know normally I want to do that, but you don't understand what's happened to me. I, I, was, I was cheated, so now I can cheat. I was wronged, so now I can do wrong. They, they spoke harshly to me first, so I can now speak harshly to them now. I was betrayed, so I have a right to get revenge. And then in our culture, we've taken that idea of our circumstances excuse our behavior, and we've expanded it to our potential circumstances excuse our behavior. Of, well, they might do wrong to me, so I better do wrong to them first. They might take advantage of me, so I need to do everything I can right here and right now. And yet what the scriptures are teaching us is God's people remain faithful even when our circumstances are bleak. The midwives had to make a, a choice of, hey, who are we going to serve here? And again, the Exodus story, it's echoed all through the scriptures. When, the, when the, the Jewish leaders later tell the apostles, you're not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, what do they say? Who should we obey? You or God? This is what the midwives are saying as well. Who do we obey, Pharaoh or God? And they make their decision. Bad circumstances cannot make us bad people. You and I must continue to hold on to that as well when life is hard, when it's aggravating, when it's frustrating. The fruit of the Spirit work in those spaces. Right? There, there is no limit to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In fact, the more you don't feel like it, the more it's going to shine out that something supernatural is at work in you. And yet I, I know and, and can tell from the silence that many of you are like me and think, that's, that's a good theory on a Sunday morning. But you don't know the jerks I work with. You don't know the jerk I'm married to. You don't know the little jerks we're raising. Like we can't, if we act like that, it's chaos, it's anarchy. And yet the scriptures are so, so clear again and again and again and again. When bad things happen, we can't become bad people. And through Exodus, we're going to see this, this story again of God proving himself faithful over and over and over again. And the Israelites' tendency to over and over again be faithless to him. But at least here in the beginning, we're given this model. When bad things happen, we do not become bad people. When you read the Exodus story, it's supposed to remind you that if bad things happen to you, you're in good company. You know, I, I know that's not terribly comforting. I know when, like, if I'm suffering and somebody says, hey, you're not the first to go through this, that doesn't actually take care of anything, right? It's like, oh, Oh, okay. Yeah, the pain is gone now because I know somebody else has been, oh, somebody else has lost a job before. Oh, great, great. I don't have to worry about it then. Somebody else has had a tough marriage before. Oh, okay. Somebody else's kids have done this or parents have done that. Somebody else has navigated this. Oh, okay, that's fine. But we are supposed to find comfort in and the same way God has delivered others, he will deliver me. As we're reading the Exodus story, it's not just a story of what God did, but it's also the story of what God is doing. He is still listening. He is still hearing. He is still seeing. He is still leading his people out. 
Again, we can trace the echoes of Exodus all through the scriptures. Just last week, what does 1 Peter tell us? Hey, if you're suffering, you should persevere just as your brothers and sisters are doing. Right? We always want to live with this bigger picture awareness. We're not going to let the enemy shrink our vision down to just our circumstances and our problems. But we're going to let God continually lift our eyes up and lift our eyes around to say, if they're being faithful, then I can be faithful here as well. But just because others have been through it, just because God works in it, does not mean that we are supposed to just sit quietly and accept our lot. When bad things happen, we cry out. When we're sick, we seek healing. When we're suffering, we ask for relief. When we're in need, we pray that God will provide. When we're in bondage, we cry out for freedom. When life is hard, we call it what it is. Again, just last week, 1 Peter chapter 5, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The lesson is not when bad things happen, you cry out if you can't handle it. Or when really bad things happen, you cry out. But whenever anything happens to you in life, your first response is to cry out to Jesus, not to see if you can handle it first. I know for, for me, at least, this is a tough one. Especially because, you, you know, if you, if you live long enough, you serve in a job long enough, you're, you're married to the same person long enough, you raise kids long enough, eventually you, you notice some patterns and cycles in your life. And you'll get to the point where you encounter some hardship and you know, I've been here before. I've dealt with this before. We've had this kind of problem, this kind of issue before. And the temptation for me in that spot is to say, I'll just do what I did last time. Last time I called this person, last time I developed this plan, last time we went to talk to this person, and we're just going to go right back down the same road we've always been down before. But if you're like me, what you've often found is that even though the problem looks the same, you're a different person, it's a different time, it's a different situation, and there's no kind of cookie cutter mold for this is how God's going to save and deliver and heal this time. God will never be reduced to formulas that we control. Right? And so this is why our, our response is always, hey, when I don't know, I'm going to cry out first. Before I try to chart my own path, before I try to achieve my own deliverance, before I try to earn my own healing, before I try to solve the situation through my own wisdom, I will cry out. And what Exodus teaches us is that when we cry out, God always answers. So if you flip over to Exodus chapter 3, we find the story of Moses. Moses is out in the wilderness. He's already had his flight out of Egypt. And he's he's out in the desert, and he sees a bush that's on fire, but it's not consumed. And so, like all of us, his his curiosity is piqued. And so he walks over to it. And as he walks over to it, the Lord speaks to him from the bush and tells him, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. And then as Moses walks up, the Lord begins with this message in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land and into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. When we cry out, Exodus tells us God sees, he hears, and he cares. Listen to his words, I have seen their misery. I have heard them crying out. I am concerned about their suffering. Now that Hebrew word translated seeing carries the meaning of intensely watching or paying very close attention. Have you, ever, have you ever had a conversation with someone where they are an intense eye contact person? Do you know what I mean? Like you're, you're just sitting there and they are just locked in and staring you down the whole time. Now some of you, that doesn't bother you at all. That's weird. The rest of us, after about four seconds, you start wondering, of like, do I have something in my teeth? Is there, did I not pop the zit? 
Did I not shave the unibrow? You're just, you're not real sure what's going on, but it's not normal to just sit there and have your eyes locked on someone else for an extended period of time. It makes us uncomfortable. Right? Even, even here on a Sunday morning, like I, I generally, when I speak, can look across the room and I will make momentary eye contact with different people. Right? I think I am at least. Your eyes are a little shaded sometimes. But, uh, it, but if I stop, right, if, if I stop and just totally lock in on one person, he's uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. You're like, will you leave that poor man alone? And so we're like, yeah, fine, we'll come over here then. Well, you know, and you're like, no, no, everybody already just looks at the ground. We don't like it, right? We, we understand that, like, that intense gaze is, is a little disturbing at times. But that's what kind of what this Hebrew word is describing for us. Because sometimes I think we have this idea of, hey, God sees me. Yeah, he, he sees me the same way that I see all of you right now. I see you, and I generally know who you are, and I know some stuff about your life, but it's much different when I stop and completely lock in and just say, I'm going to stay here until you tell me everything. Right? But this is what the scriptures are telling us. When God's people are in bondage, he doesn't just observe it from a distance, but he is intensely watching. He closely sees the affairs of your life, not just what's happening to you, but how it's affecting it, how it's affecting you. Moses writes, he says, the Lord told him, I have seen them, I hear them, and I am concerned about them. His knowledge of your bad situation motivates him to listen to your cry, to be concerned about what's happening to you, and ultimately to act on your behalf. When we cry out, God comes down. He says in verse 8, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. Now again, the, the Exodus story is a prequel to the gospel story. It's a story of God's people being enslaved by a powerful master. So he comes down and he enters into our affairs. In Exodus, it's going to be a burning bush. It's going to be the plague, sacrifices, stone tablets, supernatural signs, the parting of the Red Sea, water from a, a rock, manna from heaven, quail being blown in by the wind, a, a pillar of fire by day, or, or a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And in every situation, it's proof to the Israelites. God sees you. He hears you. He's concerned about you. And he has come down to be among you. Now, for you and I, we, we don't get the pillar of cloud or fire. Right? We probably haven't had Grand Lake parted so that we can walk through it. And yet we have an even more personal and even more powerful expression of God's presence. For the Israelites, it was all of these events and Moses. For us, it's the power, the person, the presence of Jesus Christ. In both cases, God sees our pain. He hears our cries. And he's so concerned that he acts to come right down in the middle of the mess. See, Exodus is not the story of a God who saves from a distance, but a God who saves from up close. He tells Moses, you're going to tell the people, I am. He comes to be, reveal himself. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I'm your God. I am the Lord who will lead you out. And then for generations after the Exodus, that they are instructed to tell this story again and again and again and again to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to generation after generation. So they always know when you hurt, God comes down. And when he comes down, he doesn't come down just to dwell in the misery with us. He doesn't come down just to sit and, and, and kind of help us navigate it, but he comes down to lead us out. Listen to his promise to Moses. I will come down and rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. I will bring them up out of that land and into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. When God enters into our mess, it's not just so that we will lean into him, but so that we will follow his leading out. He says he'll lift them up into a good and spacious land. If you're suffering, I hope you hear those words as God's words to you today. I'm going to bring you up 
out of that land. For the Israelites, that land was Egypt. It was the place of slavery, the place of bondage. For you and I, that land may be dozens of different things. It may be a land of doubt. It may be a land of depression. It may be a land of grief, of pain, of loss, of frustration. It might be a land of spiritual dryness. It might be a land of isolation, a land of loneliness. It might be a land of broken dreams, of broken families, of broken hopes for the future. It might be a land of anxiety and fear. And as you hear God's message, I will bring you up out of that land. May you also hear the promise and into a good and spacious land. A land of peace, a land of hope, a land of grace, a land of provision, a land of security, a land of rest, a land of new dreams, a land defined by God's presence, a land of healthy relationships, of restored joy, a land of purpose and meaning. The Exodus story is one continual story of God leading us from where we are to where he wants us to be. God's salvation plan for the nation of Israel was real. He told them, I'm going to take you into the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. He wanted Moses to know, I'm not leading you on an endless journey, but before we even start, I know where this ends. It ends in a real place, in a real land, where you will work the land, you'll build homes, you'll establish cities, you will build a temple, and you will live in my presence and for my glory. See, when God set the Israelites free, it wasn't just freedom from slavery. It was also freedom to follow him. It was freedom from being defined as slaves to Pharaoh and freedom for being defined as the people of God and the servants of God. And he continues to do the same thing for you and I. As he leads us out, he also leads us to, into this new land, into this new space, into this new identity. And the last thing we see in Exodus 3 is that when we cry out, God sends help. He tells Moses in verse 10, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. For the Israelites, God doesn't just tell them I'm going to save you. He doesn't just tell them I've heard you and I know what's going on. But he says, I, I, I have a plan for where I'm going to take you. And I'm going to send a person to lead you on that path. And so it's, it's now dependent on Moses of, hey, you've got to pack up. You've got to go back. For you and I today, we're, we're not sitting here waiting on a Moses. Our deliverer has already come. Our savior has already revealed himself. He's already shown the path. He's already provided the way. And so while Israel waited in slavery for Jesus, you, or, or for Moses, for you and I today, we already know that Jesus has come. He is coming and he will come. And he comes to lead us out. He sees you. He hears you. He's concerned about you. The situation you're dealing with has not caught him by surprise, but he has a plan to get you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And he's the one who's gonna lead you out. He's the one who's gonna guide you every step of the way. And he's the one who's going to deliver you into the promised land. In just a moment, we're going to receive communion together. It's a reminder to us that the Exodus story is not just a, a theory of what God might do or has done. But because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Exodus story is our story. The salvation story is our salvation story. That everything we need, Jesus has already provided. That we don't have to wonder, does he see, does he know, does he care, does he hear? He has answered that once and for all in his life, death, and resurrection. And now that same spirit dwells in us. And it's a spirit that not only leads us out of captivity, but enables us to go like Moses and to tell others, hey, this is the way. Let's follow Jesus out of it. So hopefully you grabbed uh, communion as you came in this morning. If not, the band's going to lead us in a song, and you'll have time to head to one of these doors and grab it. But they're going to lead us, and I want you to pay attention to these lyrics. It's a new song that we're introducing to you that tells the Exodus story and tells the difference it makes for us. So if you need to grab communion, grab that, hold on to it for a few moments. Let's allow God to speak to us and then I'll come back and we'll receive communion together. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought me deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. 
Israelites are in Egypt, their hope for deliverance really did not reside at all on their ability to hear God's voice. It didn't reside on their obedience. It didn't depend on their faithfulness. He didn't do it for any other reason, but they were his chosen people. And he saw them and he heard them and he cared about them and he was compelled to act. This morning we hold the bread and the cup in our hands and it's a reminder to us that God leads us out in Christ, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. 
And so this morning, no matter what hardship you might be facing, no matter what, how uncertain life may seem, you hold in your hands the proof that God can lead you out from where you are and into an experience of his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his peace. So today you might be making that decision for the very first time to surrender your life to Jesus, to ask him to forgive you of your sins, to take your identity as one of his chosen people let out of bondage and into freedom. Or maybe you followed him for a long time, but you're just in a dark space this morning and you need to be reminded again that he is still the Lord who sees, the Lord who hears, the Lord who cares, and the Lord who saves. As we take the bread and the cup this morning, it's to remind us of what he has done and what he is doing. You are free. You are being let out. He is with you. We take the bread with me. And the cup. Will you stand with me? I'm going to ask the band to lead us in that song again. But as we stand, I want to pray for us. So if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes this morning, I want to give us just a a second to respond to what the Lord is saying, to what he's doing. I don't know your situation. If you're in person online, I don't know how God is working. I don't know how you're asking him. I don't know what message you came in hoping to hear from him today. But no matter where we are, if we're walking with him or if we're not, the message is the same. He sees you, he hears you, and he cares about you. And in Christ, he has come down to lead you out. So if you're on a spot this morning where you need that to be the reality of your life, you need to know that God is with you. You need to know that he has a plan. You need to know that he's working that plan. Will you raise your hand so I can pray with you? We wanna pray those prayers of faith. Lord, you see us, you see our needs, you see the challenges, you see the uncertainties. And Lord, we pray today that the Exodus story would be our story. A story of salvation, a story of deliverance. A story of the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who is compelled to act by his love for us. Lord, you see the hurt, you see the uncertainty, you see the fear and the doubt that we're we're facing. And so we come to you today, Lord, with open hearts and open hands, and we say, Lord, will you once again come down? Will you once again lead us out? Will you show us the way by your power, by your presence? Will you walk with us? Will you assure us, Lord, that you have that spacious land prepared for us? Jesus, I I pray specifically for those this morning who are in a season of loss and uncertainty whether that's the the loss of a relationship, the loss of physical abilities, the loss of a job, the loss of hope. Lord, I pray this morning that in those spaces of loss, you would come and begin to fill us with hope. You would come and begin to reveal yourself as the God who comes down and the God who leads out. Jesus, we surrender our circumstances to you. We receive the power of your presence today. And Lord, we cry out with confidence, knowing that you see us, you hear us, and your love compels you to act on our behalf. Jesus, will you even now sow gifts of faith, gifts of hope? Will you plant deep within our hearts and minds a firm belief that Exodus isn't just a story we read, but it's a reality we live. That you are with us. You're leading and guiding with your strong, loving hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The band's going to lead us through a, a portion of that song again. As they do, if you'd like someone to join with you in personal prayers, uh, you can head out the back doors and to your left. Our prayer team will be we- ready to meet with you. If you're online, you can do that at christianchapel.com slash prayer. The rest of us, we're going to sing this as just a statement of celebration and belief that no matter what our Egypt might be today, God is, will lead us out from it. Where we are is not where we're going to be. 
He's the God who comes down and the God who leads out. So let's celebrate that together. You stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the head. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. As you stepped into my Egypt, you took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. go this morning, may you hear God's word to Moses as God's word to you. I've indeed seen the misery of my people. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and into a good and spacious land. God sees you he hears you. He is coming down to meet you right where you are. And he has a plan that leads to hope, that leads to life, that leads to salvation. My prayer for you this week is that you go with confidence, knowing that the Lord goes before you, that he is clearing the path into the land where he is taking you. Again, as you, as you go out this morning, if you'd like someone to join with you in prayer, please stop by the prayer room. We would love to pray those prayers of faith with you today. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine on you and give you peace. God bless you. We hope to see you in a home group this evening.